our way to show some solidarity uh, with the union. Yo, bro, you work for Amazon? You gonna vote for that union? There just won't be enough jobs to give all Americans a decent livable wage. I want my kids to grow up in a society where they don't have to struggle as hard as we do. That's what we need to fight for. I mean, I'm middle class is, you know, I don't want to say it's gone, but it erodes every single day. Do you think they're going to build any affordable housing here? Oh, hell no. I don't want to work any jobs, nights, weekends. I want a life. The trick in trickle-down economics is getting you to believe that anything which is good for rich people is good for everyone, and anything that is good for everyone else will kill the economy. A union agitator. If they're not going to take care of their employees, somebody has to. They don't invest in us. They don't show us the resources. It's just not sustainable. The, the system is going to collapse. We got to take care of ourselves. We can't rely on the government. And we damn sure can't rely on the 1% class. What the hell? This is union busting one-on-one. -on -one. They're going to spend millions of dollars just to stop that. The voting wrapping up. Now employees are waiting on results. If successful, it could spark a labor movement across the country. Look at everyone out here suffering. What are you doing for us? Our job as Americans is to fight to save this country. We need bold actions, organizing. We can't allow ourselves to be divided. It's really time to rise and fight. I need all of y'all. Are you going to get in the streets and do something? You can handle the responsibility of being a leader to say it with your chest. <laughs>
Nice. And how did you approach this this form of of activism? Is this something you were reorganizing before you started making films, or? So I mean, basically, uh, I come from, you know an immigrant family um, that uh, came from Ireland out of abject poverty. My you know grandfather didn't have a pair of shoes. He was fifteen. Um, you know, he came to the United States, basically worked as a servant. Uh, so did my grandmother, and then they both got into uh, different unions. Um, my grandfather got into Brooklyn Union Gas, my grandmother got into DC 37, uh, and it changed their lives and it brought them up into the middle class. And then, uh, and then to, to watch really that middle class just fall in my on my watch, you know. Um, uh, and then in 2008, you know, it 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 the financial crash, you know, really devastated me and a lot of my friends. So uh, I think, I mean, that was the impetus, really, for me to do this. Excellent. And were there, um, you know, as as this film came together, as you logged those, did you say 32,000 miles? Yeah. Because uh, you have to go back and, and, and revisit the people because, you know, their story doesn't just take place in a in a day. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to go back and back and back. Were there were were there things that that changed as you move through the the making of the film? I guess you know, kind of when you start out on a project like this, I'm assuming oh, yeah. you kind of you have a vision, but then that vision oh, yeah. has to contend with reality, right? Yeah. I mean, the first the first thing was we knew it was a big problem, and then we we started to find out that it's much worse than we ever had imagined. <laughs> um, and that people are doing much, much worse than we could ever possibly imagine. You know, we were some things that we didn't didn't even make the film. You know, places in Mississippi, Louisiana, um, where people do not have running water or electricity in entire areas. Um, you know, and uh, you know, people living on seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour with no public transportation. I mean, how does that even work? um so uh and we didn't set out to really make a union film to be honest and we knew it was it was going to be one leg of it you know um but when we asked every expert what is the solution they said union unions are organizing you know organized people and uh, when i asked dr gary evans what the you know what the solution was he's the uh child psychologist on poverty he said unions and i almost fell off my chair i said i guess we're making a union movie you know um yeah well and i think you know the film just um you know it speaks to the lived conditions of that economic immiseration so many have felt over the years and i thought that um yeah the sections of the film that just talk about kind of the um you know the the way that like um you know, people are trained to think within neoliberalism, right? Like the the, the psychological pathologies of neoliber neoliberalism, not only how we sort of externalize them upon others, but how we're, you know, we, we actively sort of internalize them, right? You know, mm -hmm. you, you hear these interviews and you just, um, you get a sense, and this kind of reminds me of a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a seminar on a, a local housing initiative that's going to introduce mm -hmm you know, progressive tenant rights to Tacoma, uh, so much, in my opinion, much needed tenant protections. Um, but the way that like, you know, uh, this mindset leaves people feeling like extremely confused and ashamed and sort of in this sense of hyper competition with each other. Um, and, and what organizing does, and I think, you know, Mm -hmm. These are the vehicle for the opposite, right? It sort of, you know, it, it provides people with a sense of solidarity, right? It's it's the opposite, right? It empowers people and reminds us that we're we're actually in this together, right? And that that my well being is connected to your well being, even if we're, you know, thousands of miles away. No, one hundred percent. And um, the more you know, and and the more I mean, we, we can see it now, right? It's happening right now. Uh, when we started the film, um, you know, there's hardly an article about income inequality and there's hardly an article about unions, really. And every time we'd see one, we'd be like, oh, we're on the right track, you know, once every five months. And now it's every day. 
right? And uh, UAW had a massive, massive win today. Um, I mean, you know, they have a they have a tentative agreement with Ford, and some of the members are going to get a sixty eight percent increase in salary, and they got rid of the two double tier system, which destroyed every union. You know, once you have two tiers, this tier starts to hate this tier, right? And then the infighting starts, and then the the solidarity breaks, and that was by design, like that was that was a designed uh, play. And, you know, and, and then in the film, you, you know, you see that this was all thought through and designed this, you know, the, the, the neoliberalism, the, the uh, Milton Friedman's, you know, ideology. And, you know, when I was asking Nick Hanauer, why didn't Clinton and why didn't Obama do something for poor people? And they, they said they, they truly believed it, right? You know, the people on Obama's staff were right out of the Chicago School of Business, which is Milton Friedman's spot, right? The Chicago boys. So they they truly believed that if you help the poor people, it'll hurt them. And if you help the rich people, it'll help it'll help the poor people. I yeah, mean it's... insanity. <laughs> I mean, the, the film does a good job of arguing that there's there's absolutely nothing inevitable about this, you know, the 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 economic stratification we're feeling right now. Right. Yeah. It's the, it's the product of like, uh, you know, an extremely well organized, um, you know, if, if you read it in a novel, you would almost think it's like, a you know, a, a plot by a bunch of super villains. Right. But it's, yeah. you know, it's it's infiltrated politics uh, of course it's infiltrated um you know the judiciary um oh yeah, yeah. I, I i mean uh kurt anderson who's in the film he's like our our wise man on the hill wrote evil geniuses right and i think that's a book that everyone should read or listen to on audiobooks um he really spells it out i mean they really are diabolical and they're uh they're you know tenacious and they're brilliant mm -hmm. You know, and and um, you know um, the he the you know heavily funded think tanks that um, billions of dollars have been spent on, you know, and the people that work in those think tanks are out of Harvard and Yale and Princeton, and they're the best minds of the country, you know. Mm -mm. So, can you tell us a little bit about? Um, I feel like you've got you've got Chris Smalls as sort of the bookend to this this film. Um, mm -hmm. you know, huge Chris Smalls fan. Um, but but also at the backdrop of this film, you've got, uh, you know, Bessemer versus Long Island, right? Amazon Workers Union versus the the unsuccessful attempt to organize in Alabama. Um, can you have, and so you were and you were there for both of these, which I feel like is, is just kind of amazing history to have played, yeah. you know, a, 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 an adjacent role alongside capturing. Um, What's your take on why one succeeded and one did not? Um, I, well, I think it's really obvious. Well, there's several reasons, but what, one main one. Uh, the one with Chris Smalls was it was an inside out uh, unionization. People from the, the inside wanted change and worked their butts off to create that change. And the other one was uh, an outside union coming in to try to change them. And they didn't have the connection to the workers. Hmm. And also, there was a lot of cheating going on by Amazon at the same time. So in an Amazon factory, you could have 150% turnover per year. Right? So this, the people that signed the card may not have been there or probably were not there for the vote. And then they had fake mailboxes that they set up and who knows what happened to those votes. I mean, it's really, you know, um, I mean, they followed us around in black SUVs. Um, they had Chris arrested. You know, it's like, it's craziness. Um, they spent $25 million to, in both instances to overturn the, uh, the unions. Um, but, it, but it goes to show you that like, Seven to 12 people really in Chris's circle went up against the richest guy in the world at the time and won. 
So that gives me so much hope. You know, yeah. um, while we were making the film, I didn't have as much hope because we went through, you know, we went through it all. And, um, you know, and then when we were down in Bessemer, the, the, the unions down there blew us off. They wouldn't even meet with us. I mean, it was really, it was very, very uh, disheartening, um, to say the least. And well, we were in, yeah. I was going to say, and I'd imagine a pretty like anxiety inducing situation for somebody making a film trying to figure out how to end it on a note that's not just, you know, 100% doom and gloom, right? Yeah, and we had finished the film with, like, this hope. And then and then Chris won. Nice. And, of course, we filmed, the, you know, we kept filming. And then uh, we read it, re-edited the whole thing. Um, because, you know, a real win is better than a hopeful feeling, you know. Oh, I mean, it's great to be able to point your finger at something tangible and say, yeah, you know, see. Um, and I think, too, you know, organizing within those fulfillment centers, I mean, the, you know, the odds are stacked against you even before the employer gets involved. When you talk about like the, um, you know, the rate of turnover, it's like, how do you organize in a in a workspace where the employer has designed the job for turnover? Right. It's like, you know, these people aren't supposed to climb their way up the ranks they're supposed to work until they're too exhausted to continue to work and then they're supposed to be replaced right and the work yeah. itself is like you know it's super atomized i mean nowadays people are you know they're they're wandering around these fulfillment centers that are the size of like you know olympic stadiums it's just them with a with a you know an ipad and they're grabbing and yeah it's it's not that kind of um it doesn't lend itself to that kind of like water cooler organizing that like, you know, most people think about when they think about like the workplace, right? Yeah. But what was good was because they had so many people inside that during the union busting meetings, the, the, the members, the, the core members of the, uh, of the union that was attempting to be formed would say, well, that's not true. Right. Because they would just lie. Yeah, you know they lie and they lie and they lie, and, and they can hold you in a meeting for hours, just to um, you know induce doubt into the into the whole unionization. Um, yeah, uh, so so they were in Bessemer. They didn't have that, right? They didn't have a core group that was inside that could call out the lies during the meetings. Can you can you talk about that like um, maybe the role that salting played within that like rank and file strategy because we had people who were sort of actively seeking out employment there just to agitate right? Uh, well, I, most of them were already in. Okay, they were already in. the The, the spark was um, they people were dropping from COVID, um, and they didn't have masks or gloves. Meanwhile, they're shipping out hundreds of thousands of masks and gloves, but they wouldn't give them masks and gloves. Uh, and one person would like pass out and uh, and they would just pick them up, put them on a bus, not an ambulance, because they didn't want to have an incident report. Yeah. And then they just put another person there. They wouldn't even clean the, the workstation. So it was just, I mean, they really treat them. They don't treat them like human beings. It, it's unbelievable. I remember the the New York Times. I have to pee in bottles. Yeah, the because every New second York. is deducted from your from your. Uh, it's called time off task. So every second that you're not moving something is time off task. So if you go pee, and the you know it's like a three square block warehouse, so you might have to walk like ten minutes to the bathroom depending on where you are, and you walk back, and if you hit thirty one minutes, you're fired by the ai by on your pager or you know on your phone or whatever and then your security code doesn't work to get back in the building god yeah i i remember hearing mm -hmm. uh there's a podcast from the the new york times that took took some folks inside an xpo fulfillment center and um yeah they were interviewing some folks and like one of their colleagues died and they just yeah. like put up a cone next to her and told everybody to get back to work she was like in cardiac arrest. They're like, no, no, you know, you you all get back to work. And 
Yeah. I mean, th- th- that's what they think of us. You know, that's what they really think of us. They either think we're a commodity to be extracted from, like every every little every bit of monetary, you know, that they can they can extract from us either through healthcare or through rent or through you know mortgages or whatever. Um, that's or they just think we're just disposable. You know, they would treat the robots better, right? The the robot would be taken aside and fixed, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I feel like that was the robot's valuable, right? Yeah, that was the silver lining. I remember in that podcast was these jobs are terrible, but the good news is they're going to be replaced by robots probably within the next 15 years. And it's like that that should not be the the glass half full interpretation of this situation. Right. It's like, yeah, yeah, because in in a in a very stringent capitalist system, once you can no longer uh, be productive or be extracted from, you're worthless. So what happens when 47% of the population uh, is replaced by AI and and robotics, right? So this is all short-term thinking on the part of the C-suite or the billionaires. Because if no one, like Hannah Hour says in the film, if no one has any money, who's going to buy the stuff? Right. And, but what really happens is it all collapses well before then. But Uh, once you have, yeah, once you have a a, a young population between like 16 and 30 that hits above like 22% unemployment, look out. That that's one of the details from the film that is it's frightening. And I mean, you you know, you place it right before January 6th, but this idea that, you know, that, that, that this level of income inequality, historically speaking, globally speaking, Mm -hmm. um, you know, only foretells one outcome, right. Which is, you know, periods of crisis, you know, rise of authoritarian figures, um, you know, the suspension of law as we know it. I mean, and it's, you know, I, I, yeah. I mean, you don't have to have a an aluminum foil line baseball hat to like, no. you know, look at the headlines and see that a lot of these boxes are being checked at this point. Yeah. I mean, any any time you have a population that has an either a real or perceived fall in status in a in a society opens up a fissure for the the blaming of the other, whether who, who you know, whether it's Jewish people black people, immigrants, refugees. Um, and then you see this fascist regurgitation, uh, which is happening now. And QAnon is kind of like a thirties, you know, machination of, uh, really bad stuff. And then it, and then you, then you start to destabilize. Um, so, I mean, when I talk to people who are doing very well, I'm like, this doesn't end well for you either. You know, in fascism, right? It, it, when it, if that takes over, I mean, that's where we seem to be leaning. We're not seem to be leaning toward communism. Uh, so when fascism takes over, uh, and I'm the leader, uh, and you have the really nice business, well, my brother-in-law now owns the business, right? Yeah, and that's the way that works. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that that's like, I mean, you know, I, I teach labor studies here at UWT, and and I do have students occasionally who will, you know, they, they take a class because they have to take a class, maybe they're in, um, I'm not going to pick on my my computer engineering students, but I mean, I've, I've heard from them, oh, this isn't, you know, like, why should I care about labor? Like, I'm just trying to get my degree so I can get a job in software developing. And I think like, you know, your decision to include you know, a software developer is kind of one of the key figures who's, you know, suffering economically. Like this is, you know, for folks who aren't feeling it right now, I mean, like, you know, I mean, I'm witnessing it in higher ed, sort of just the the kind of rising tide of precarity, right? It's just that shifting demographic where, you know, even before I got into this line of work, it seemed like, you know, there were certainly adjuncts, but there was a, you know, a kind of a healthy, category of tenured professors. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I wanted to be a tenure professor and instead I've got a teaching track job, right? Which is, and that, that portion of the pie that's tenure track continues to shrink while the adjunct section continues to expand. Um, and while uh, intuition continues to rise. Exactly. Yeah. So the um, extraction of all, so it's, it's the extraction, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a financial extraction from the workers, the professors, where I used to have a, a really good job and a, you know, a stable future to uh, a much a more unstable future. And it's happening across the board. And what I would say to those coders is, um, have they checked recently? Because uh, AI is starting to code. Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, and then like, if you look at the, the VFX uh, teams in Hollywood, they all just unionized because they're sick of working 18, 20 hours a day, you know, for a box of pizza, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah. no overtime, no protections, no nothing. It um, we've got a comment on the chat board about the um, just the depiction of housing insecurity. And I think, we, like mm -hmm. I said, we actually had an event here a couple of weeks back about kind of the connection between labor and housing. Um, but what were your thoughts in terms of like, you know, touring the country, meeting with workers and sort of, um, you know, learning more about their their housing situations and how those are connected to, uh, you know, their working lives? Yeah, so now we, we're what's happening now is we're seeing very large organizations like BlackRock and other um, large uh, financial institutions that are going around and buying up private private homes, you know, starter homes, and they're outbidding everyone. So the, the new, you know, the new family is being outbid by these people who then rent that house to someone like them for much more than the mortgage would be. And then they can never, they can never get the money saved to buy a different house. Right. It's, it's like, um, you know, that was like the generational wealth. Yeah. And then you leave it to your kids and then they have, you know, and, and of course that didn't happen in, in, in all instances and certainly didn't happen in minorities, uh, situations in the, if, largely with redlining in the past. Um, so, you know, um, you know, in a true democracy, right? We, we, that we would ban that. We'd ban that tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so we really have to organize, come together, and vote out these people that are that are not uh, working for us. I mean, you, you know, we we can't say we can't be overwhelmed. We can't say that uh, someone else is going to do it. We have to really, or you know, spend some time every month you know, on whatever it is that you want to help change and help change it because no one's going to do it unless we do it all. Yeah. And I think that's the, that's the thesis of the film, right? It's that it's going to take work and it's going to take organizing, but at the end of the day, we're, you know, the, the tools that we need to use are here, right? It's, yeah. it's in those connections and in those, um, you know, the, the relationships we can establish with others. Um, yeah. Yeah, somebody in the comment just said that the, you know, the idea of owning a home and I mean, I, you know, I work primarily with people who are kind of in that beginning phase of their adult lives. And um, this is something that is, you know, I mean, I know you're, you're joining us from New York, you know, in, in the Seattle area, you know, property values are through the roof. And my students are, are I think, legitimately concerned about ever kind of like arriving at that you know, the, the, the white picket fence version of success in America, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the way, the way to change that is to, to build a f much more affordable housing and to raise wages. I mean, everyone's not, most people, 90% of the country is not making what they should be making. Uh, it's just, you know, uh, minimum wage from 1965 factor for uh, productivity is tw should be twenty four twenty five dollars an hour now. That's minimum. Yeah, it's seven dollars and twenty five cents in the United States. Yes, in in different places it might be a little higher locally, but in the nation it's seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour. 
like in Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, you know. I mean, do you see efforts to, and I, and I feel like this is, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, we get the $15 minimum wage and if, I mean, it's a victory, right? But then when you look at that chart, it's like, well, geez, yeah, so you've just, been fighting for 20 or 25. Of course. I, what Hanau, Nick Hanauer says um, was like, fight, you know, they're always going to fight you. Like, like if you ask for a 25 cents raise in the minimum wage, they're going to fight you as hard as if you say $30. Yeah. Right. So go big. Right. So to $15, it was cool, you know, 10 years ago when they were fighting, when they started first started fighting for it or whenever that was about uh, eight years ago, whatever. And now it's not enough. Yeah. Uh, and that's and Jackie mentions in the chat, inflation's just a, pay cut for the working class and that i mean we have that here where yeah. it's you know cost of living skyrocketing and it's like you know if your yeah, wages yeah. are if your wages are the same from year to year you're effectively taking a pay cut every year right yeah in the last two years you got killed yeah if you're just making it and this is a stat that that you know made me really wake up um well um solid ground which is near you guys um he said uh he said, um, every hundred dollar rise in the median rent, homeless homelessness goes up 10%. Oh wow. So we're, everyone's right on the edge, right? And not everyone has a you know a couch they can crash on and a good family situation, you know, where you could fall back to the basement, you know, apartment or something like that, or whatever, take a spare room. Um so it's you know that's that's scary and if you don't have mental illness when you become homeless you you're gonna have it after a month or two <laughs> oh, after a month living in your car or on the sidewalk yeah <laughs> no. um and i think you're i mean the film does an accurate job of discussing how the you know the social safety nets that that I mean, the social safety nets that we collectively weave together with our tax dollars, right? How those have slowly been stripped away or privatized um, by for-profit industries. Oh, I was just in London uh, giving a speech and um, I was like, do not let them take away your health insurance. They, have, they had one of the best universal health plans that they put in effect right after World War II. And they've just been chipping at it and chipping at it and chipping at it. And Peter Thiel, who's out of Silicon Valley, horrible person. He uh, he's he got he went over there to do data for um, um, for COVID, and then realized how much he can make off of privatizing it. So he's he's putting like hundreds of millions of dollars into like getting them to to propagandize them to say this is a terrible system we have to have a system like the americans i'm like six hundred fifty thousand dollars six hundred fifty thousand people go bankrupt every year in the united states because of health care and many of them most of them have insurance in the beginning yeah it's it's a it's a sociopathic mindset in my opinion right yeah like the idea of seeing crisis as opportunity right of seeing oh, yeah. You know, yeah. seeing these 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 homes that people were forced out of in 2008 and saying to yourself, oh, we could just buy them all up. We aggregate our money and then we can rent them back to them and keep them in a state of like, you know, housing indentured servitude. Um, I would suggest everyone watch this week's uh, um, John Oliver uh, explain a lot about McKenzie and how this is how this is, you know. Planned and it's. And and any young people here, this is not how it was when I was growing up. Uh, you could live, you know, and have an apartment and, you know, have save money. And, um, you know, it's uh, buy a house, save and buy a house. That was all. You know, and, and health insurance was cheap and it was good and you didn't have to pay anything. You know, it's like this is all recent and it's all on purpose, you know. Um, but I have hope. I mean, you know, we're seeing everyone is fed up. And, you know, Sean O'Brien and the Teamsters, that was the biggest 
you know, the UPS guys are making like over a hundred thousand now a year, right? The union, it's working, you know, today Ford, you know, capitulated. Mm -hmm. Some of their members are going to 68% raise. That's going to change their lives. So it is happening. You know, it, it don't give up hope. It, you know, it, it, the tide is turning. I have a lot of hope. I, I do too. I and mean, it's easy to get sort of in that, you know, start circling the drain uh, <laughs> with the dark thoughts. But I think that, I mean, yeah. today is a big day. I think, you know, Amazon Workers um, United, I mean, that's the Amazon Workers Union. That's a huge victory. And I think it's, you know, it's one that um, like, if you look back, you know, the historical corollaries, like those, those union wins, they, they do, that rising tide does float boats, even in non- unionized um industries right it it, yeah. it encourages people to explore you know labor and i think that you know even from my perspective and as a non-organized or non-unionized academic um like it's in the ether in a way now that it wasn't you know i mean i've been teaching labor studies for almost a decade and when i started nobody really you know i mean people cared like i cared and i had a couple yeah. of students who cared but but not to the degree now where people are just like you know, I mean, they've there, there's kind of a desperation, right? People are interested in learning about this thing that could potentially, you know, uh, solve some of their problems. No, hundred um, percent. Yeah. yeah, and you know, we really have to get the right people voted in. Um, and if we could do that, if we could survive two more presidential election cycles, I think. Um, things are going to change greatly. I'm optimistic. Um, I mean, I have to be, right? I mean, I've got kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and you don't give up, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the New Deal, you know, the New Deal with, the, you know, all the labor laws created the middle class. It wasn't really a middle class. It was a merchant class maybe, but it really created the, the whole middle class here and the American dream. And I think... You know what what Nick says in the film. You know, everyone. The minimum we have to uh, ask for is everyone that that works hard and plays by the rules has a good life because there's so much money here. There's so much money here. Yeah, it's it is. unbelievable how much money there is. Well, and I think um, you know films like this are are a fantastic way of kind of reaching out to folks who you know, are curious, um, but are looking for sort of like a, a digestible sort of aesthetic document that's, you know, emotion. we had people in the chat board talking about how they were getting misty eyed. I'm, I'm wrapping up the movie with goosebumps. Um, it, it just hits on, you know, an, an academic level. But again, I think where it's the strongest is just in those those personal stories and kind of, you know, letting us get to know these people and seeing, you know, seeing what capitalism's doing to them but then also seeing them you know fight back um yeah i mean so so facts will make you think stories will make you cry and make you feel right and you have to we 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 did our best to weave this them together so that you can think and feel and and when you do that i think you can uh, um you know cause change nice well, I think that, you know, considering you're zooming in from the East Coast is probably a fantastic place to to wrap cool. things up. I just want to say one thing. Thank you all for watching this and really thank thank you for hosting it. And please help spread the word on this film. It's available on all the streaming sites. Um, you know, tell your friends to watch it. It's, I think it's like a, it costs you a cup of coffee to watch this thing. So, um uh yeah please uh we got to get the word out where you know i'm traveling all over the world uh you know doing well, these talks and, mm -hmm. i was gonna ask if you if the tour takes you through seattle um you yeah know. no i will i'll be back in seattle oh yeah we uh, should set something up on campus i mean you know yeah. oh, that would be amazing yeah well let's um, um I, yeah there's two things i have to go there for I'm, I'm gonna try to loop it all together okay yeah. By April the way, seems, yeah. I was gonna say super excited to see April on the, yeah, the she's great. Mm -hmm. She's the best. Um and she's gonna she's gonna lead the the AFL CIO nationally. That's my prediction. 
I'll, I'll, I'll put 20 bucks on it. <laughs> yeah, I would not be surprised. She's, she's a yeah. force to be reckoned with. Um, well, yeah, we should. Oh, God, now I'm thinking, you know, we can do an event with her. And I mean, we can yeah. go through this, but I will yeah, shoot yeah. you an email. Um, thanks. Thanks to everybody who's still on the Zoom for staying. Uh, this class technically ends at 730. So <laughs> we're about an hour over. But yeah, we Thank just really all. appreciate your work. And um, yeah, looking forward to getting getting more sets of eyeballs on this film. Yeah. No, thank you so much. All right. Well, thanks again. Yeah. Cool. Bye-bye. Thank you all.